All right. All right. How many of you were not here yesterday? So I know. Were not here. Were not here. You were, you were not. What? So how many of you are here? Okay, you're enough. Huh? I was wondering. All right, so we started a teaching on the tabernacle of David. And during my time, I will teach predominantly from that standpoint. Uh, why is this so important? Because I want to get into something this morning. Acts chapter 15 from verse 6. Acts chapter 15 from verse 6. It tells us, and what happened was, just to show the relevance of the tabernacle of David as a message of the gospel of God's kingdom to the Gentiles, what happened here was there was a discourse there about the message that Paul and Barnabas were bringing. And some of the people who were neck deep in Judaism began to resist them. So Paul said, well, let us go up all right, to um, Jerusalem to go and thrash out the matter. And so when they got there to what you call the council of the elders, Peter got up and supported uh, what uh, Paul was saying, and he said this in Acts 15, verse 6. So we see the story here. Quickly, Acts 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there, was, there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, he said this, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silent, and gave audience to Paul and Barnabas, declaring the miracles, wonders, and that God had wrought among the Gentiles through them. So Paul spoke about a vision that he had. So Peter spoke about a vision that he had. Paul spoke about the signs, miracles that they did. Now, so we continue. But those two were not enough, all right, to swing it. You had to establish it from Scripture. So, it tells us in verse 13, go back to 13, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. All right, Simeon had declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And so these agree the words of the prophets. So this message to the Gentiles, he said, a prophet or prophets have spoken about it. So he wanted to cite one of the prophets. And he said, these agree the words of the prophet as it is written. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, say the Lord, who doeth all these things. So he was talking now, James said, what God essentially is doing among the Gentiles is the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David, among us. And that's why Paul taught and said, let the word of God dwell richly in you in all wisdom. Talking about speaking to yourselves, say this here, teaching and admonishing one another in a psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, 
singing with grace in your heart unto the Lord. In other words, the word of God getting into you richly in all wisdom shall produce psalms, hymns, spiritual songs unto the Lord. So we saw last night, we started looking at this, we'll still look at it more in the future. One element there, and a major element that God gave David, that he brought into the earth, was the power of corporate worship, the power of praise. All right? I don't want to go into it, but, you know, yes, I do agree that there's online church, but you can't replace the real essence of coming together is corporate praise and worship. You remove that, all you are doing is communication. All right? So the idea that online can replace physical is a fallacy. Are you following what I'm saying here? That is a fallacy. It is not scriptural. That can be an ad hoc arrangement, but you cannot remove its corporate worship. You can teach through mediums, but corporate worship is something that brings the anointing of God into the situation. So I just said I should mention that there. All right? We have to always go with scripture in whatever we're doing. Now, so the whole essence of the tabernacle of David was that David said, we need to get the ark and bring it now, all right, to Jerusalem, and I want to set up a tent for the ark of God. I was going to put an image of the ark so we don't see that it's ark and see what is a box. All right, maybe next time I'll do that. But we need to get the ark and bring it but there was one reason why David said that ark has to come here. And he said it in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 3. 1 Chronicles 13 and 3. So one dimension of it is worship, corporate worship and praise. And it's very powerful. So anytime, and David used it as a strategy for warfare. He said, once there is a battle, gather people together and begin to rejoice and begin to give God praise, right? And start worshiping him. But there was a reason why he wanted the ark there. And in 1 Chronicles 13, he mentioned it, verse 3. He says, let us bring again the ark of God to us. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. So what David was saying first and foremost is that we need the ark so when we get into any situation, we will go to God to inquire. What are we supposed to do? Now you understand what he was saying when he said, one thing I desire is that I might dwell in the temple of God, behold his face, and to inquire of him. One thing have I desired, O Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to do what? Inquire in his temple. Second step after, about David's tabernacle is this. If you are operating from that place, you don't make any decision without finding out what God is saying. There is nothing like it. There's no brainer here. Let's do it. All right? You go and inquire. Even when David, we're looking at the secrets of David. When David was in Ziglag and he went, took his folks to war, and they told him that we don't want you to fight, we don't trust you, the Philistines. By the time they got back, the enemy roundabout had come into the village, set it on fire, taking their wives, taking their children, all the people that were following him, right? They're taking women captives and all right, and all of that. And the people wanted to stone him as a leader. And David was under intense pressure. It's the difference between Saul and David. Saul was under pressure and said, The people are leaving me. He didn't ask God, he went with the people. And let me just say this, we live in a society now, particularly with social media, that people are pushing. All right? This, that's minister's conference. I won't say some things here. But you have to be careful as a minister that you don't lose and bury your ministry on social media. 
You may post something and get 5,000 likes and God says, me and you, you can go. Because Saul saw that and told Samuel, he said, the people are leaving. Therefore, I forced myself. David was under pressure. There. They've taken your wife and children. David went and inquired of the Lord. Shall I go or not go? How do you maintain leadership if God tells you? And David said to Abitha, the priest here, I pray thee, bring hither the ebot, and he brought it to David. And David went and inquired, should we go up? And inquired, saying, shall I pursue after? I mean, everybody wanted, well, let's go and get. He said, should we do it? So second thing about this tabernacle is, David understood not just praise and worship, but he knew the whole of life hinged on direction. He went to God in prayer over decisions. So Psalm 27 from verse 1 to verse 8. Now, this is my message. Let me just go through this here about tabernacle. So it's not just, well, we're singing, we're praising. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came up to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. And then he shared his thoughts. One thing have I desired, O Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble... He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he will set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted above my enemies round about. Therefore, I'll offer in his tabernacle sacrifice of joy. I will sing, I will sing praises unto God. Verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, seek ye my face, my heart said, thy face, O Lord, shall I seek. So in the tabernacle of David, they went there, principally in prayer, to seek the face of God, to ask for the counsel of God. The face of God means the thoughts of God, which means what is on the mind of God. So you come to seek his face to find out what he's thinking about this particular thing. I want to show you the power of seeking that face here, right? And in practical here, to seek his face there. In Psalm 80, verse 1 to 3, we'll see what he does when you seek his face. He says this, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwell between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, stir up their strength and come and save us. How that? Turn to us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine. In other words, in between the cherubims there. So what we had was the ark. You had the mercy seat. You had the cherubims that were to face themselves. Then the mercy seat was on top of the ark. Say this again. The mercy seat was on top of the ark, ranking here on top of the ark, and then God says, when you come to that seat, I will cause my face to shine upon thee, and you will know exactly what you are supposed to do in that situation. So David understood the power of direction. Jeremiah 10, 23 and 24, he tells us this, Oh Lord, I know it is not, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You are to walk, but you can't direct where you are going. It is not in man. You have to take direction, all right, from God. Then the next verse. He now said, correct me, verse 24. He talked about correcting. Oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thy anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. So here he will go up, is how David was, and ask, should we or should we not? 
should we? And that's what mattered to David. It is not in man to do that. So God wants to lead. In that tabernacle there, he says, is about leading. It's about giving you direction. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 from verse 9 to 13, you will see how God empowers and blesses. Deuteronomy 10, now it says, um, sorry, let's go to verse 32, I think. Let me check something here. Wait a minute, I'll get it there. Uh, all right, the scripture that he said, he led us about in the, he found us in the howling wilderness and led us about. Huh? All right, sorry. Determine chapter 32, verse 10. Sorry. All right, verse, from verse 9, sorry. It says, <clears throat> for the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, how does it change your destiny and outcomes? He found him in a desert land. And, and, and this is what God is saying, when you seek his face, you are seeking for, uh, we'll see this here, direction. The mistake we're making is we go to prayer to look for things. We go to prayer to ask God to give us what we think is appropriate for the situation. God says, this is what David knew, you come up to me and your prayer should be, give me direction. Mary said, when the wine finished in the feast, Mary gave us the key to the miraculous. Whatsoever he tells you, do it. Don't go there, just go and ask him, Lord, you saw this before I was born. You've prepared something. Instruct me. What do I do? That's what Jesus was saying. We're talking about manifesting the kingdom. He said, don't pray like the heathen. They are asking for things. Seek ye first the kingdom. That seek my face. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So in Deuteronomy chapter 32, <clears throat> it says from verse 10 here, he found him there, and he says, in the west howling wilderness, led him about, he instructed him, kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over a young, spreadeth abroad her wings, and taketh them and beareth on the wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the field. So he moved him to his face. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So we need to start asking. So whatever you have in your hands that you are doing, just start praying to God. Show this here, and seeking his face over it. Lord, lead me in this thing that I'm doing. Guide me. Show me things. Teach me. So don't start praying, asking for things, which means I determine that, look, uh, this is how we should be, and then I'm praying it. But go up to God in prayer and ask for his wisdom. Now let me show you what happens. Let's assume somebody, you have a job, and what you are doing is seeking the face of God. And then we go there and seek the face of God. I think one of the problems that has happened to Word of Faith is that it was infiltrated with positive thinking. So what happens is that we mix the message. All right, remove the cross and mix the message. And when you mix the message, what you're trying to do is that it, they, they, it must be what, you know, so that feel good effect. But the truth is this, go to him. Just go and seek his face. What are you saying about this thing that is in my hands? Now let's look at this. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse five. Put it up. Or from verse four. And he did that which was right in the eyes, this was one king, because of time, let me just say this, according to all that his father Amaziah did. Verse five. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, 
who had an understanding of visions, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now, what's the meaning of that? And he went forth and warred against the Philistines. Now, what's the meaning of that? You are king. And what you're doing, same thing Solomon said. Look, I seek your face. I'm not asking for riches, long life. I'm seeking your face. During this time of my reign, Lord, what are the things that you have in your heart that you want me to do in this work I am in, in this thing that I'm doing? And we get to verse 15. When you get home, you can read it, verse 15. All right, or let's read from verse 14. It says, Uzziah prepared for him throughout all the whole shields. Now, as he was seeking God, they, started, they got into innovation. Shields, spears, helmets, all kinds of things. Look at what happened in verse 15. And he made in Jerusalem engines back then, invented by cunning men to be on towers. Who, can you fight this kind of person? On towers and upon bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones. And his name spread abroad. For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. So if you are seeking the face of God on what you are doing, innovative thoughts start coming. With the innovation, you spread and become global. Instead of asking God, promote me, promote me, promote me. Are you getting what I'm saying? Eh? But you see, what we have seen is seeking the face of God, we've made it very theoretical. When you seek the face of God, you're asking God, so what will you have us do? What will you have me do in this thing that I'm doing? And the ideas start coming from God. And the thoughts start coming. starts guiding you. He starts showing you things. And it got to a point where this man started building engines, cannons, all kinds. I mean, how do you fight that kind of person? All kinds of things. While you are still coming on horses, they are firing arrows with, using engines. All that innovation came to him. So seeking first. Now, let me tell you, and God told me this. He said, my people are begging me for things when they should be building things. Do you get what I'm saying here? We are begging God, let me prosper. If you build something, you prosper by what you've built. And that's because you've seen the thoughts there of God concerning the very thing that you are doing. So in that tabernacle of David, sought the face of God, and God began to reveal his thoughts. And that's what David was saying. He said, God, this year, what are the things that you want us to get involved in? Where do you want us to be? I want to see your face. What are the things you're going to show me? And God now starts. That's what David said. He said, thy thoughts towards us, they are more than can be numbered. In other words, that's the rain that comes from heaven. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts. Which means his thoughts begin to come. He says, the, he says, this land that you go into is not the one you came out of, that you watered it with your foot. He's saying that the ideas that you are going to use in this land is going to come directly from God. So his ideas begin to come in. You start building new models on the earth. You start showing new ways of getting things done. You start devising. God is showing you his face. Things he has kept secret from ages and generations past. What's the, the black man? What's his name again? Uh, Bill, Dr. Bill Wilson talks about him, who, who devised 300 things from one peanut. He said, I will enter into the lab and God will remove the veil. What's his name now? Um, yeah, Carver, God, Washington. It says, God will remove the veil. And God says, you can do this, you can do this. Peanut butter, all kinds of things. That's what he's talking about. Which means you start seeing his face. Seeing his face is not that you understand something in Isaiah. Do you get what I'm saying here? is that he's disclosing the very thing you are doing. That's what he was telling Isaac. He said, Isaac, there's farming. You don't need to depart. If you see my face here, you will, the method, I, that thing was that, I think that was the first man that got water from the ground. In other words, God said, am I not the owner of the earth? There's not just water coming from heaven. There's water inside the ground. He reveals his thoughts. And when you start getting God's thoughts, those thoughts generate wealth. And then he shows you again, this is what I want you to do with the wealth. 
So he says, seek my face. And he said, thy face, O Lord, shall I seek. So having said all that, let me say what I came to say. <laughs> all right? So I just want us to understand that an element in that tabernacle also, I mean, you can't disobey God and praise yourself. You get what I'm saying. It's, it's not uh, magic. All right? You get instructions from God. Now, what I want to talk about here quickly is that another element of David's tabernacle, which many people don't really see, is that David was an intercessor. When I say he was an intercessor, David understood mercy. On top of the ark, all right, of, of the ark of God was the mercy seat. What David brought in was that mercy seat there. He was a man that understood mercy. And I want to show something concerning. Why do you think every time people, when Jesus showed up, and they called Jesus the son of David, what did they ask for? Mercy. Listen. Any time, go on, they said, son of David, what they wanted was mercy. The man understood mercy. And when you know mercy, you lift judgment. All right? He knew the mercy of God. Revelation chapter 12. Let me just start and connect to last year's message. Revelation 12 from verse 7. Quickly, Revelation 12. And there was war in heaven. I want to show because manifestation of the kingdom. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. And they prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. After that happened. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, which is called the devil, and Satan, that deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels with him. Verse 10. And they heard a loud voice saying, Now is come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God. In other words, manifestation of that kingdom. And the power of his Christ, because we've cast out the devil. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Which means if he's not cast down, you are not going to see manifestation. It says, which accuse them before God day and night. In other words, that is his business. Jesus is right there making intercession. And Satan is right there bringing accusations. Now I want to show you what happens. So you know the practicality of this. Next verse. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And today, what I want to sit down with is that they love not their lives to death. Three things. The blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. That scripture doesn't mean that they were ready to die. That's not what he's saying. I'll show you what he's saying. But he says, by the blood and by the word of their testimony. Now, what do you mean by blood and the word of the testimony? Last year I said this. I had an old evangelical minister, British minister, say that, and he's correct, and I'll show you from the scriptures. He said, he said, by the blood and the word of testimony means your personal testimony of what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. But before we get to that, let's see what is really going on. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. I want to stay with the New Testament before I go into the Old. So you know that this actually is reported in the New Testament. Now, if the Bible says they overcame him by the blood, it means that that war was going on after the blood was shed. And God himself, the Father, said, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy what? Footstool after Jesus finished the work. So that the work is finished doesn't mean there's no warfare. Do you understand this? Doesn't mean there's no warfare. Now, 
Let's look at what it says. First Peter chapter 5, 8 and 9. Be sober, these two Christians, and be what? Vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, that's the phrase you know, walketh about, seeking for whom he will devour. In other words, he's looking for. Who can I get to? So he can't just get to anybody. He is looking for something. Next thing he says this. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren in the world. Now, where did Peter get this concept of Satan is walking about? Because all their thoughts had to be scriptural. And the only scripture back then was the Old Testament. So we now go there. Because if I started from there, you'll say, no, since we're born again, that doesn't happen again. So I showed you that Satan is still doing what? Walking around the old place. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Now, what did we learn yesterday? We learned there was Moses' tabernacle, there was David's tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle was the burnt offering. David's tabernacle was what? Praise. Now watch this. Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and the man was what? Perfect and upright. It means that he was a good man. He did things right. He wasn't a bad man. Perfect and upright. He's not a perfect and upright person this should happen to. Listen, what happened to him if, the, if we heard that somebody, if you hear, if you hear that somebody one day, children died, echo, ah, you say that man. Ah. 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 With our doctrine. Ah. Generational cause. Ah. Orogun, yeah, In other words, it's, it's, step, it's the warfare, family warfare. We will... And this is what has ruined the church. We have built doctrines on experience. And nobody has said, show us inside the Bible what you are saying. So he was upright and he was what? Perfect. And one that did what? Feared God. And ensured evil. But please note this. With all of this that Job was doing, when Job saw God, Job said, I heard of thee by the hearing of my ear. All this one I'm doing was second-hand knowledge. It's what they told me about you. Now I see you. In other words, it happened because Job was void of one knowledge. Are you following what I'm saying? We've said this conference is the mysteries of the gospel. In other words, we want to unveil things. Now, so let's go to verse 2. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Now watch what Job was doing. His substance was also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500, and all of that. And the man was the greatest of all men of the East. And his sons went out and feasted in their houses, everyone his day, and he sent and called for three sisters to drink. So these guys were, were, were in town. And it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent and did what? Sanctified them. Now you people. And rose up early in the morning and did what? Offered what? Burnt offerings according to the number of them all. And it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. This Job did what? Continually. Burnt offerings. Next verse. Now there was a day when the sons of God, I'm trying to shut a door so you don't think Satan can do this to you. But what do you do to win that war? Do you understand this? You have heard that what he was offering was burnt offering. Next verse, let's go to the next verse there. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan was also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan said, answered, Going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down. That's where Peter got it. Peter didn't just say what he was saying. 
He got it there. In other words, Satan took him with the children of uh, sons of God, angels, and God said, where are you coming from? He said, I'm going around the whole earth. What was he looking for? He who he would devour. And he said, I'm going low, to and fro, up and down. And then next verse. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, upright, one that feareth God and ensureth evil? And Satan answered, doth Job fear God for naught? Has thou not made a hedge about him, his house, about all that he has on every side? Bless the work of his hands and his substance is increased. But, but put forth thy hand now and touch what he had and he will cause thee to thy face. Verse 12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thy power. Only upon himself thou shalt not do. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Verse 13. And he says, And there was a day the sons and daughters were eating and drinking, wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were, plow oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Serbians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and only I am escaped alone. In other words, things started happening. This one that collapsed, all of that. But nobody knew that this was behind the scenes in the spiritual. So the first point I want to get is this. Something manifests in the natural. It comes from conversations in the spirit. If there are unanswered accusations, it manifests itself. In other words, something happens in the natural. But when you remove the veil, you'll understand that it came from a conversation that was going on behind the scenes. And the Bible still tells us that Satan is still trying to get to people this way. So he says, look, Part of coming within the veil is to understand what is going on in heaven and know how to position yourself in order for it not to happen. So what is the first step? The first step, the Bible tells us that Jesus, your Passover, has been what? Sacrificed for you. Now what does that mean? When they were going to come out of Egypt, God said, let me tell you how you can be saved from the angel of death. He gave them a secret. What you should do is the father of the house should kill a lamb. Each family puts the blood in a basin. Take a hyssop and apply that blood to the doorpost. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, God didn't say when you kill the lamb. God didn't say when the blood of the lamb has been shed. He said, when I see the blood, in other words, that blood has to be applied. If you kill the lamb and you didn't apply the blood, the angel of death was coming in. So you can say that, listen to me, Jesus died for all my sins, you are correct. But it's not only for your sins he died, he died for the sins of the whole world. He is not just the propitiation for your sins, he is propitiation for every single person. In other words, that blood was shed and it has been put in a basin for every human being on this earth. How do we know this? Quickly, we see this here. In, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says this, 1 John 2, 2. It says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, that substitute now, and not just for us only. So don't get this thing, it's just us. But also for the sins of the what? Whole world. Now, what's the difference between us and the world? It's found in Romans 3, chapter, 5, um, Romans chapter 3, verse, verse 25. It says this, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissions. In other words, it's people that put faith in the blood that reap the benefits of it. Now, the blood has been shed for everybody, but not everybody has their faith in the blood. So they ask you, how is it that the angel of death will pass by? You have only one confidence. The blood has been shed. What are you doing? I am applying the blood of Jesus to my doorpost. What does that mean? This is what it means. 
Psalm 107, Psalm 107 and verse 2. It says, you put faith in the blood. What does it mean? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed, which means he may redeem you, but you have to say it. So the blood was shed. How do I transfer it to my doorpost? I say it. I say he has been wounded for my transgression. I say he has been bruised for my iniquities. So the defense against what Satan is doing, he says, and there was war in heaven. And then he says, how did they overcome him? By their testimony of what the blood has done. In other words, they were taking the blood figuratively now that was shed and they were applying it directly to their life and Satan was there and he couldn't enter because the blood was there. All right? So there was war, right, over that and the blood was constantly being applied by them. So it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hands. Now he may have redeemed you from the hands of the enemy, but if you don't say it, So they overcame him by the blood, which means it can't just be the word of your testimony, but it has to be forced by a sacrifice and then by your personal testimony of that sacrifice. So the person is declaring. Now, but having said that, it says there is another element to this and is that they loved not their lives unto death. What does that mean? In other words, you may be confessing the blood, but it doesn't work because of that third element. It is not that you are willing to physically die. That's not what he's saying. John chapter 15. Just want to touch on something. Verse 13. John 15 and verse 13. I just want to show something here. He says, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life, please note that, for his friends. For his what? Friends. How did Job get out? When Job prayed for his friends. All that were hallowed burnt offering. When Job prayed for his what? Friends. How do you open the door to Satan? Competition with friends. The Bible says a man's enemy are those of his house, especially. In other words, the internal competition. That's why I say Satan is moving in. That's why I call him the accuser of the brethren, which means among brothers there's accusation. So what Satan is doing is coming through the accusations there. And I'll show you. Because remember, he said, they have built a hedge round about him. So, what was going on there? And that's why Job stood back and said, now I've seen the realm of the spirit. I can lock Satan out of my life permanently. If you have the confession of the blood, and if you are laying down your life for your friends. Now, what does this mean? Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the word great. And he shall divide the spoil with the word strong. Which means, I'm going to give him the portion. You want greatness? He said, let me show you how it will come. He says, because he has poured his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressor. He bare the sin of them and made what? Intercession for the what? Transgressor. So what God is calling to, he says, you confess the blood of Jesus Christ, but he says there's a ministry of intercession that I'm calling you to, and it's to love your life, not your life unto death, to lay down your life for your friend. The truth is, the farther people are from you, the less they know. So anybody who knows your flaws will be close to you. 
So the person who is likely to be offended most in you is people that are close. Because you are, that's where you rub, those are the people you rub off. Now, that, I want to show you this. That's where the intercession should be. Now, look at this. To intercede for others, and that's the final thing in this. All right? The order of Melchizedek demands this. Now, <clears throat> Jesus came and said, the Father is seeking for what? Worshippers. Before that, Isaiah had said, God is looking for something else. David's tabernacle worship. The next thing he's looking for is intercessors. Why is he looking for intercessors? I'm not saying that people judge, oh, we're just praying, we're just praying. I'm talking about intercessors. Look at what he's saying here. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 29. I want us to, un so we understand that spirit well. Ezekiel 22, 29. The people of the land have used oppression, exercised robbery, vexed the poor and the needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Next verse. All right. And I sought for a man among them. In other words, the only person that can intercede for a group must belong to that group. Why do you think Abraham had to say, we need to find righteous men inside? If, if, it's going to, if there's going to be salvation, that's why the blood is shed, everybody according to his family. So what happens is, actually in the realm of the spirit, in the body of Christ, God has placed you inside a cell. Whether you know it or not, you are inside a group. And he says, who will be the greatest among that group? The one that will lay down his life for the rest of the people. Some people, the group has scattered. You know why the group has scattered? Because the firstborn of that group, when it came out, they killed the firstborn. When you kill the firstborn, you, not, nobody there will know the way into any place. Because the firstborn will show you the pattern, which means if you do it like this, you're going to get into it. But why do we not have firstborns? Because people kill firstborns. I've said this before, but I don't mind saying it publicly. I don't. When I was struggling in ministry, I didn't know what was happening. God told me, he said, come. He said, go back to yourself. All right? He said, go back to yourself. I went back there. He said, he said, wait. Who in the group, when you, all, when you got born again, in that group has done as the principal Forerunner and firstborn of that group. He said, Look well. I looked. I said, Reverend Chris, are you a clue man? He said, Yes. He said, What did he do to break through? I said, He went on television. He said, Go. Are you from here? So there's the group he says from among. Now look at what he's saying here. Look at next year. Now you see the hedge, how Satan came in. That he should do what? Make up the word hedge. So if the person there is not interceding, the hedge is opened. If the hedge is open, Satan comes in. God help you that your intercessors are not accusers. The mystery is that those who are supposed to intercede for you are the first set of people that will experience your negative thing. So if they get offended and drop their guards, Satan will walk through. If they are, have accusations, that's why your inner circle, you don't play with it. Because that is your last defense. So he said, make, so when Satan looked and said, I said, you place a hedge around him. It means you've placed people. That hedge is not that they put wire in the spirit realm. <laughs> now, so where are we going to? If you confess the blood, that's what Jesus said, and you're working on forgiveness, then the blood has been nullified. 
when the Bible talks about your heart being sprinkled from an evil conscience, what do you think he's saying in a dimension? The blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. What he's talking about is your heart. You can't come up. That's why Jesus said, if you have ought in your heart against any, that means you are refusing the voice of the blood. Listen to this. If, if I say it now, people will say that, hey, it's my friends that have been doing me. Oh. <laughs> but even if you're, what way I'm getting to is that even if your friends want to do you and you have goodwill to them, that hedge will be formed. That's where I'm going to. If you are in touch, even because what happened to Job was that his friends were opposing him. But when Job was interceding for his friends, that hedge was there from there. But I heard Pastor Jack Hayford say this. He said, and I'd seen it before I read the book, and no human being on this earth I have ever heard teach it. He said, when the unforgiving servant, when he refused to forgive his fellow servant, he took him and shot him up in prison. And then they went to report him. And then he says, tormentors were sent. He said, we teach about working on forgiveness and this torment. But what about the man that was locked in prison by another man? This is what he said. He said, I had an uncle that robbed me off wrongly. In my, no, he said, my wife's uncle and in-law robbed me off wrongly. He said, he said, let me call him Uncle Joe. He said, and I, I resented him. He said, a day came that the Holy Ghost told me, that man's salvation is not getting saved because you've locked him in a prison. He said, release him now. He said, I did it. One week after, he came to meet me, somebody that we used to fight and said, do you know I've just seen what you're saying? I've given my life to Jesus. He wrote inside that book, I'm not putting world evangelism on your shoulders. And saying people are not getting saved because of you. He said, but who is in your prison? And the people you probably put in your prison are the people you should be interceding for. That prison is witchcraft. Wait, when he says, it's witchcraft of steroids. Listen, listen. When, when he says, <laughs> that's why Peter, when he came out of jail, he said, God has delivered me from the hands of Herod, but the expectation of the Jews. You only have one defense to that. Make sure you are interceding for everybody in your inner circle. Let me close. Time is up here. So, look at it. Verse 22, 29, 30. Next thing he says this. All right? Now, look, please. Christian relationship is not pardism. Christian relationship is not we took photograph together. Christian relationship is not we took selfie. Christian relationship is, are you on your knees for your friends? Don't, don't tell me, don't, don't listen to me. You, you, somebody has called me to preach in a meeting, and when he invited me, the way he introduced me, I said, are you at war with me? In other words, you may have called me because you feel I'm popular, let this person come, but really inside your heart, your heart is not with me. And I told him, this is the last time I'll be at your pulpit. They're not fighting that. So people can be say, hey, what's happening? But inside, that's what David was saying. He said, when they were in trouble, I went to fast. Remember he said it? It's not who is greeting who, it's who is praying for who. <laughs> you understand that? And only God knows who is praying for who. So let me close here. So it says 29, uh, verse 30 here. It says this. I sought for a man among them that should make the hedge. So God is looking for people that will make the hedge. And to stand in the gap before me that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them and I have consumed them in the fire of my wrath. For their own way 
have I recompensed on their heads? In other words, if I found a man, I would have averted that. That's one of the things Moses was. Moses stood before God. God said, it's time to deal with these people. He was an intercessor. God said, I will raise another nation. God was trying. He said, God, no. He made intercession. This is why this doctrine of cursing people is not in the Bible. And I will close with this. You are to lay down. The reason why you want to curse is because you don't want to lay down your life. How can somebody offend me and go scotch free? People will even tell you that. That can pass. How can you say mercy? How can you say mercy? So they will just go. They won't pay. Let me tell you when an institution is dying, when there's hypocrisy. You say they don't pay. You won't call what you did. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now we'll understand this verse 7 and 8. And I'll close here. It says, I have seen servants upon horses. Go and meditate on this thing. I have seen servants upon horses. Look, I have a circle there. God told me, say, whatever you become in ministry, my friend, you see these guys? That's what Joseph understood. Joseph knew that I became prime minister. If my brothers come to meet me and I reject my brothers, I will be removed from prime minister. Because the prophecy was that you will go as a forerunner to bring Israel in. It is not just your brilliance, it's the mercy of God. Do you understand this? Because God has a plan for that. Are you hearing me in the spirit? So there are some people, we don't want to take this, but that's the truth. There are some people, if you are a firstborn, when you say firstborn, I'm talking spiritual now. If you don't make it, they cannot make it. Their destiny is tied to you. And those people always act crazy and shoot you. But what you have got to do is survive their bullets to help them in the future. So when he says the stones, the builders rejected, has become the chief cornerstone, he's not saying that you now will deal with them. He says you are now the foundation of what they will become. One of the people I knew, I didn't even know, I spoke to a friend of mine, we did a discussion on, on this. I said, oh, come, we did a discussion. I mean, somebody that is in my, in fact, when we're in school, she, she because, I mean, of course, she would say, well, we're on your board. Joke, joke. I'm, I'm losing her maybe in 20 years. Maybe I've seen her once or twice in 25 years. She told me, she called me, she said, my foot up and said, my father died. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, is something? I said, yes, oh, I know. I said, so she tells me, said, he was your fan. I said, are you serious? I mean, this is a brilliant professor, a serious dude that used to head things in the country, economic thing. I said, eh, he said, I said, I said, he said, so the funeral service, we want to come and do it. I said, tell me the day. He said, 7th of January. I said, I can't. And I sent the flyer of, of Wolfbeck. You know what she said to me? She said, we will move the date to the 11th of January for you to be there. It's destiny. I said, I will be there. All right? Of course, it's COVID compliance, so we're very few. And she said, after that, we'll head to Ijebu. So we'll finish service in Trenchard Hall. In, and we're going to, I say, Ijebu, you, you know, for you to even ask me, <laughs> shows you have standing that we finish and we head to Ijebu. <laughs> Do you, I mean, I mean, even someone in this church will not come and say, when you finish here, we go to Badu, then from there we go to Jebel. I said to it, I, I said, what did I say? <laughs> but he asked me that thing. God says, remember the covenant I have with you. Are you hearing me? So let me just, I, I have to say this one. 
So you get it. So the hedge are people. No, all right, I don't finish it. I've seen many Ecclesiastes. I have seen servants upon horses, princes walking as servants upon the earth. What cost it? He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent will bite him. How does Satan come in? You break a hedge. What's the hedge? You didn't intercede. Didn't you hear what Samuel told Saul? He said, Saul, you have lost the throne. You have done all of this. He said, but I won't sin against God not to pray for you. Your madness will not stop me from intercession. He said, or else, as you are going down, my own ministry will go with you. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Quickly look at this. That's why I've appealed to people, don't curse any me. The people that they're cursing are the closest people wants to them. If you're a firstborn, you must carry the marks of your family members. The family member you are insulting the most is the one that will open the doors for you. Get any fellowship together, the one that they are fighting and shouting on. Very soon, that person. Romans 12, 20, I'm talking about your circle here. Therefore, if thine enemy be hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. If in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, overcome evil with good. Now, go to verse 19. It says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for vengeance is mine. I will repay, say the Lord. God says, look, I'm going to repay. That repay doesn't mean I'm going to show those people. He's saying, I will pay you. If your enemy be hungry, give him food. He said, I will just do what I'm saying, and I will say to you. By doing this, you say, no, I will heap coals of fire on his head. The coals of fire, and I want to close with this, is the benefits of the bond offering that you bring within the veil. So you know the animal was sacrificed on the altar, but you have to carry the coals of it into the veil. The high priest will do that. And then you put the incense on the coals. That's how it starts coming up. Without the coals, yes, your praise and worship. That's why Jesus said, if you have ought in your heart against your brother, leave the offering. It won't ascend to heaven. We put the offering on the coal. That's what burns it and it goes up. Look at Proverbs 25, 22. I hope it's not too deep. It's simple. It's deep. The Bible is deep. If it's not, if you, a message that they're preaching is not deep, it's not gospel, but it must be simple. But you have to be saying, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> quickly, quickly. Proverbs 25, 21, it says this. If thy enemy be hungry, feed him. Give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. 22, 20, 21, 22. For, all right, 22. For thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, remember the intercessor doesn't want the recompense to come on the head. So what you are doing is he needs somebody to step in to put coals of fire on the head of that person so that the judgment passes. Anybody doing that, when they make their own mistake, God looks at it and says, judgment, pass. So when David entered where they were eating shoe bread, we were hungry and took it. Go there. If you are not operating in mercy, go there. As you are eating, God will teach you a lesson of life. <laughs> some people can do it. Some people cannot. So let me close here. Job 42 verse 10. But that there's more. Close everything. I have to close now. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he did what? Prayed for him. That's the instruction. And the Lord gave him twice. Because it all came from conversations in the heavens. Now, what's this call to fire? Leviticus 16, 11 to 13. 
will continue some other time. He says, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall make at least the day of atonement, atonement for himself, for his house. He shall kill the bullock as sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beating small, and bring it where? Within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the what? Mercy seat. So when you bring, make the, you make intercession, what you are doing is you are securing the mercy of God over their lives. God says, you did that for your enemy. I will reward you. You did that for somebody that hurt you, I will reward you. Because it's not an easy thing to be offended by somebody and then you are making intercession for them. Many years ago when we started the office and uh, we started church, so I mean it was, it was, it was fair, I mean, what happened then was, and it came from the campus fellowship, so the assumption was that you start church and all your campus people will come. Okay? That's why I always tell people, do not do inaugural service. You will just cause problem for yourself. Because your family, friends, everybody will come. You will think you are broken through. Then, your members of your church who want to join you, too, will think that you are broken through. Because you started with 200. So they will be happy. They will shift their faith from the word to the 200 that came. Only to come the next Sunday. So I went to start you. I told him, don't do it, no cry. I said, Pastor, don't no, no, no. Money, but boy, We have walked this path before. Don't do it, no service. He did. The next Sunday. <laughs> In fact, someone called me and said, I said, so what's happening? You started? He said, yeah. I said, so what's it? He said, I'm waiting for the keyboardies for church. <laughs> I said, welcome to this church. When you open the window, where is the keyboardist? And then you do the sound wheel. All right? So, and so, so one time did something, forgive. Somebody in the office, she came to me, she said, she said, why do you treat these people that hurt you sometimes better than us that are with you. <laughs> she, she said to me, say, why? He said, it looks like to get the best out of you. <laughs> and this, this being with you is not paying us as well. <laughs> but the idea behind it is, that's why I don't, if you want to be part of the new tribe, leave this, my enemy must die. If God wants your enemy to die, he will arrange the death without your hand being there so that you shall not be guilty of murder. Thou shalt not do what? Kill. So the day Saul was going to die, God made sure David didn't go to battle. So there will be no confusion. Or you fired an arrow by mistake and the arrow landed on Saul. Blood must not be on your hands. Reverend Emiko told me something when we started this ministry. He said there are two paths to success. He said one is longer than the other. But the second way that he shot has blood. He said you will get to the top, but your conscience will be stained with the blood of people. And the joy of that success, you will not have it. Let me tell you this. When I did my 50th, one, this same lady that used to be in the office, same lady. That's because she was in fellowship with me. She became vice president. I made her vice president when I was leaving. She looked around. She said, every group from your childhood is here. People in primary school that were with you are here. Secondary school are here. We that were in fellowship that didn't follow you, we are here, represented. Those who, he said, every, he said, you carried everybody along. You know why? Because if you're afraid, we will keep quiet. 
Because who will be greatest? The one who is servant of all. Who is servant? The one that will carry inside your heart. All right. And pray for people and intercede for people. Let's not confuse intercession with external friendship. The reason why, let's not confuse two things together. That you are beside somebody doesn't mean from the heart you support that person. That's why spiritual people will tell you, God knows my friends, I know my friends, full stop. What are they trying to say? Means they get vibes from people, they know how they're praying for people, interceding for people to, for their support, and all of that. They understand it with God, but don't interpret it as external things. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that is what God told Adam. He said, from the sweat of your face shall you eat bread. He said, why? He said, thorns and thistles shall it bring to you. In other words, everybody that surrounds you in that inner circle will oppose you. And once everybody in your inner circle is opposing you, you will do what? Sweat. Let them pay you in hundreds of thousands of dollars in a job. And let them surround you with bad people. You will resign from that job. You will leave the job. They'll say, what about the money? you say, money? <laughs> you'll say, money is not everything. Peace of mind <laughs> and long life. You will resign from the job. So a place is determined by the people there. That's what mistake Lot made. It was well watered, but the people were wicked. He went there. It is better to eat a muscle where there's unity than to feast where there's strife. Do you understand what I'm saying? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word and by the power of your spirit, I ask that you establish us in this truth, expand it within our consciousness in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you all. So we're going on a 20-minute break because we have to follow protocols. We pray here.